Well, friends, we are going to continue on in a series of conversations that we're calling the Upside Down Kingdom. We're working our way through Matthew 5, 6, and 7, a piece of text called the Sermon on the Mount. And we'll be in Matthew 5, 27 today, but, but we're just going to review like Susie did last week. We want to take time always, because these scriptures are so often misunderstood and misapplied that we want to keep the main thrust what is happening in view. So the Sermon on the Mount really starts in chapter 4, verse 17, when Jesus announces in summary that the kingdom of God has come near and he invites people to repent. And then Matthew says that he is going to continue teaching and proclaiming the kingdom and healing every disease and setting free demon-possessed people. And the idea is that the kingdom comes both in his word and in his action. The king comes in word. What does it mean to preach the kingdom of heaven is drawn near? Well, that's what Matthew 5, 6, and 7 is all about. A, a, a corpse of Jesus' teaching that talks about the nature of his kingdom. And then the healing stories that come in chapters 8 and 9 are all proclaiming the kingdom in a different way as well. So you have both, you have both proclamation and word and indeed. Jesus then gets to chapter 5. And he went, uh, he saw the crowds, and remember the crowds here from chapter 4 are people who were demon-possessed, who were having seizures, who were in lots of pain, who were day laborers. I mean, it's like, like not a crowd of religious elite that have gathered around him. And he pu pulls his disciples up on a mountainside. Now he's talking to his disciples, but in the amphitheaters around the Sea of Galilee, you could hear him. So he's teaching the crowds too. He began to teach them, and he begins with a section of text that we call the Beatitudes, Blessed are the Poor in Spirit. We looked at that several weeks ago, noting that Jesus isn't giving us an ethical list to climb or to emulate, but rather, he's drawing on groups of people mentioned in the Old Testament who are not satisfied with the status quo, who have room in their hearts for the new thing that God is doing, and he announces to them that the fulfillment of all of these Old Testament expectations is being presented to them in the person of Jesus. After that, he gives them a vocation to be salt and light, and it's in their weakness and their brokenness that he exercises this vocation. They remind Israel what it is to be Israel, and they provide light to the world, drawing people to the worship of Jesus of Nazareth. Then what Jesus does in chapter, later on in chapter 5 is he announces he's not come to abolish the law and the prophets, the Old Testament, but to fulfill them. And fulfill means to interpret them rightly and teach others to do the same. It doesn't mean it's now disregarded. Jesus is Torah with clothes on. He's showing us the heart of God as he walks around in human form in first century Galilee. Not only that, but then the, the key part we looked at a couple weeks ago, and this is super important in verse 20. For I tell you that unless your righteousness, righteousness isn't just your personal holiness. Righteousness is your congruity to the kingdom of God as it expresses itself throughout the social orders of the world. For unless your righteousness surpasses that of the Pharisees and the teachers, the, those who were considered to be religious elite, you will certainly not enter the kingdom of heaven. And remember, Jesus is now going to give six illustrations of his first critique of the righteousness of the scribes and Pharisees, namely that their critique that their righteousness only exists on the outside, not on the inside. They've not taken Torah seriously. And that Jesus is going to show how true rightness, the righteousness of the kingdom, is of the heart. The second critique he's going to give is in chapter 6, where he talks about how they often performed their acts of righteousness publicly. We'll save that for chapter 6. But that is all reminder to say what Jesus is giving us in six examples. Susie dealt with anger and murder. A heavy command, do not murder, shown to be equated with the light command, right? Do not hate your enemy in your heart. Jesus is going to do this now with adultery. Giddy up. Matthew chapter 5. And as always, questions are welcome. Please interrupt. Um, unless you are in high school and want to know how far is too far, I just want to say ask your parents. So um, there you go. Verse 27. You have heard it said, you've heard that it was said you shall not commit adultery. 
But I tell you that anyone who looks at a woman lustfully has already committed adultery with her in his heart. If your right eye causes you to stumble, gouge it out and throw it away. It is better for you to lose one part of your body than for you... Uh, for your whole body to be thrown into hell. And if your right hand causes you to stumble, cut it off and throw it away. It is better for you to lose one part of your body than for your whole body to go to hell. Let's close in prayer, brothers and sisters, and just apply this to our lives. Right? Oh my goodness. Now, we're going to go sentence by sentence through this. Jesus is doing the same thing. These are six illustrations of the kind of righteousness his kingdom is made up of. Right? So just go to verse 27 for a second. You have heard that it was said, you shall not commit adultery. Have we heard that command anywhere? Like, is, is that one of the top ten? Would you, would you kind of reckon? Right? It comes from Exodus chapter 20. And notice it says in Exodus 20... Exodus 20. Joe, what happened, man? We had, there it is. And notice, it says the exact same thing that Jesus quotes. You shall not commit adultery. Now, adultery is really interesting because our understanding of adultery is, is infidelity on behalf of any spouse. Back then, adultery was something much different. Adultery first only consisted of the touching of body parts. That was when you committed adultery. But second, there was a huge double standard Shocking, right, ladies? That women were the only ones held accountable for marital infidelity. Theirs was unconditional fidelity. For men, yes, it was, it was sin and frowned upon, but it was permitted. Married men could have sex with uh, prostitutes, divorced women, unengaged, unmarried women. There's even a test in the book of Numbers that's really weird to tell if a woman has had adultery, but it's never applied to the man. And remember, when the, the Pharisees catch a, a woman in the very act of adultery in John 8, they only bring the woman, they don't bring the dude. So adultery was very much, shocking ladies, I know, very much something that was enforced towards the female side of things, not as much towards the male side of things. So there was a big double standard in adultery back in the day. Now, Verse 27 says, you've heard it said, you shall not commit adultery. But 28, then he brings up the light command. But I tell you that anyone who looks at a woman lustfully has already committed adultery with her in his heart. Now, five minutes of tedious background. Are you ready? The word he uses here for lustfully is actually the Greek word that the Septuagint, which is the Greek translation of the Hebrew Bible in the first century, uses to convey the idea of coveting. So Jesus is actually quoting another of the Ten Commandments here. You shall not covet. Go ahead and, and go to Exodus 7, or 20, 17. Now, you shall not covet your neighbor's house. You shall not covet your neighbor's or his male or female servant, his ox or donkey, or anything that belongs to your neighbor's. Now, this is so interesting, my friends, because coveting was considered the lightest of the Ten Commandments because you can't measure it. How do I know if someone's coveting, right? How do I even know if I'm coveting sometimes, correct? So he's taking the heavy command, you shall not commit adultery, and he's equating it to the light command, you shall not covet. Now, notice what is wife here included in a bundle within? Servants and donkeys. And notice the phrase, anything that what? So adultery was a sin against the property of another man. That's what coveting was. Coveting your neighbor's property. And part of that property included the wife. Right? Jesus here, uh, go back to um, 18. Jesus here is not condemning sexual desire, not even remotely. He is condemning, covet is an action word, it's not a desire word. Covet doesn't mean, oh, I want something. Covet means I want something and then I give my will permission to act towards getting the thing that I'm coveting. 
So Jesus, this is so very important, and thus begins our PG-13. Jesus here is not condemning normal sexual desire, not even remotely. But I heard, and I thought, as I grew up in certain strands of evangelical culture, that sexual desire itself was the problem. I can't tell you how many newly married couples I've counseled back in the day who were told it's dirty, naughty, bad, they get married, and all of a sudden they can't just flip that switch. So it's so important to understand what Jesus is saying. Jesus isn't condemning sexual desire at all. He's condemning looking at someone for the purpose of coveting, and coveting is an action word. It's not a desire word. We're filled with all sorts of desires, Absolutely. Hey, that's a great car. I'd love to have that. Ooh, that house is fantastic. I want a jacuzzi, right? None of that is coveting. Coveting, and I really do want a jacuzzi. (laughs) Coveting is when you reorient your will to act. That first turning towards, that's what it is to covet. And then proceeding to act upon that desire. Does this make sense? This is so important. And notice it's the motive here that's addressed looking at a woman in order to covet. So in order to act upon that desire. It's not looking upon somebody and saying, wow, they're super attractive, right? Or else I couldn't preach, right? You'd all be stumbling. (laughs) Not sure that's how that works, but you know, we'll see. (laughs) In fact, The word for covet that we translate lust is actually not an exclusively negative word. It just means desire something greatly, desire to covet. Like Jesus himself will say, I lusted greatly to have this dinner with you, he tells his disciples. So it's only, (laughs) it's, it's only since, I don't know, the last couple hundred years that lust has taken on the exclusively sexual connotation. But covet can be anything. Are you with me so far? All right, back to the text, if you would, my friend Joe. 28, I tell you that anyone looks at a woman lustfully has already committed adultery with her in his heart. Now, does Jesus believe that actual adultery and coveting are the same thing? Is he that foolish? Of course not. He's undermining, he's illustrating the rightness of the kingdom over against the rightness of the Pharisees. He's not saying, well, if you've already started to covet, you might as well do the whole thing because you're guilty of the whole thing. Not even remotely, but like with anger, right? He's simply saying, do not murder. It's not enough. For the Pharisees, it was enough to not murder. Jesus says, my rightness deals with anger and contempt also. It's not just enough to not touch the body parts of another person. My kingdom is a kingdom of purity where people are actually working to resist the action steps that desire points us toward. You with me? Now, he then engages in typical rabbinic exaggeration to make these points. These are not literal points, and most of us know that, or else we'd be walking around here without eyes and hands. Uh, There were some church fathers that took this seriously and um, did get rid of a certain body part. Um, Matthew 5, if your right eye causes you to stumble, gouge it out and throw it away. It is better for you to lose one part of your body Then for your whole body to be thrown into Gehenna, which is the word for hell there, a valley outside of Jerusalem. And if your right hand causes you to stumble, cut it off and throw it away. It is better for you to lose one part of your body than for your whole body to go into hell. Now let me ask you a question. If you cut off your hands, could you still lust? Could you still covet? Yeah. So is this an issue about cutting off body parts? Does that solve the problem? Well, if it did, he's missing one very obvious one, at least for the gentleman, right? So this isn't an issue. He's not making the point, listen, guys, really go do this. He's making the point about the urgency of his kingdom rightness. In other words, he's warning, listen, this is of such an urgent matter. This is is a matter of such urgency that whatever you have to do to resist acting upon the desires that you have, do that. So he might say today, listen, if your computer causes you to stumble, throw it out. You know, if your phone causes you to stumble, get rid of it. He's he's exaggerating to make a very profound statement. This is not something to be played with. And the rabbis did this all the time. Here's one example of rabbinic exaggeration. 
right? When three people eat at one table and the words of Torah are not spoken there, it is as if they ate at the altars of the dead. Wow. But when three eat at one table and bring up words of Torah, it's as if they ate from the table of God, blessed be he. Now, obviously, so so if you're having conversation and you're not talking about Torah at dinner, what's the point there? Is your whole meal unclean because you're eating at the altars of the dead? No. But the Torah should be on your lips always is the point. Makes sense so far? So the gouging and the cutting and all of that, he's just saying this is a matter of great urgency. All right? Now, any questions so far on this? This is the exegesis part. This is what the text means. Any questions so far? Great. There'll be questions after the next part, I'm thinking. Now, there are three implications here that I want to cover. Um, And the first one is very simply, and and Jesus assumes it here, though it's super subtle. But but we need to be told every now and again um, about the goodness of sexuality, that it was actually a gift and not a curse, though we all experience it mostly as a curse. When I was 13, my um, youth leader pulled me into a room, and he handed me something called the biological hand grenade ladder. And it was a ladder. At the bottom was holding hands, and at the top was, you know. And, and as you went up the ladder, the consequences were more explosive. Okay, that was the idea. And so I'm having this really awkward conversation with somebody who I don't know, who's using words like petting and heavy petting, and I'm just totally freaking out as a little junior high guy. And, and, um, and that was all I heard from my church about sex. Thou shalt not. It's so nasty we don't even talk about it in church. The Bible begins, the rabbis have a field day with the fact that the first command of the Torah is to have sex. Go ahead, Genesis 128. God blessed them and said, read it. How do you do that? I mean, he could have said, plant seeds in a garden. He could have said, here's a flock of storks. But instead, <laughs> right? But instead, and I'm, I'm being purposely flippant here. But instead, he gave us a whole body experience that involves all five senses and unites us with another image bearer. And the Bible begins, and Jesus assumes this. He's not condemning sexual desire. The whole process of arousal, the whole process of of foreplay, all of that is a gift. I mean, of all the ways to fill the earth, this is the way that God gifted to human beings. Now, of course, it's fallen, and we experience it as a curse. Understood. But the Christian church never starts with its good. It always starts with it's bad, and many of us have suffered from the hangover of that emphasis. So we just have to start by saying, first of all, and Jesus assumes this, that sexual desire is a good thing. It's a good thing. And I know for some of us, that's like, no duh. For others of us, that's something really hard to get a grasp on, because, because, because. We were so conditioned early to see sexuality as something to be afraid of, not something to be enjoyed. And so you even have a whole book, Song of Songs. We'll teach that one someday. And, and, it, and it, it isn't, as some would say, a metaphor for Yahweh's love for Israel, although it can be used that way. This, this book very much feels like a lot of erotic Egyptian love poetry that would be sung and chanted and celebrated on a wedding day. And so all that is to say, just we don't have to go much further to make the point. But that the messages that the church conveys to the world, the messages that we convey to the community of disciples, and the messages that we convey to our children all begin with it is good. Now, because it is good, it is powerful, correct? And so the second implication is, is coveting matters because of where it leads and what it does. 
So notice what Paul says in Ephesians chapter four when he talks about disordered desire. He's talking about the Gentiles here, but as a Gentile, I can appreciate what he's saying. They are darkened in their understanding and separated from the life of God because of the ignorance that is in them due to the hardening of their hearts. Now, this is the text that's super interesting to me. Next slide. 19. Having lost all sensitivity, they have given themselves over to sensuality to, so as to indulge in every kind of impurity, and they are full of greed. Now, Paul uses a whole bunch of like really nasty sounding words, but he actually kind of diagrams how it is that desire can become disordered and lead us into coveting and beyond. So the first word he uses is having lost all sensitivity. And this simply means, in the, the Greek word literally means the condition of being void or past feeling. You've indulged in something so much you no longer enjoy it. Right? If anyone struggled with alcohol, at some point you stop enjoying alcohol. And instead, you use it, right? Same thing with food. At some point, you stop enjoying food, and you use it. Same thing with coveting. At some point, you stop being bounded by the normal expressions of sexual desire, and you lose the sensitivity originally that you had, right? This idea of losing all sensitivity, this is so well captured, in C.S. Lewis's Lion, Witch, and Wardrobe by this young man, Edmund, one of the four kids that goes into this land of Narnia, who is trapped uh, and seduced by a white witch uh, because he's very hungry, and hunger, of course, a normal physical appetite, but she bewitches something called Turkish delight, which is a kind of candy, so that the more he enjoys, the hungrier he gets. And so that he quits enjoying it and begins to use it. It's this incredible picture of enjoying something, but then losing enjoyment the more you indulge in it. That's what this picture is. Having lost sensitivity means condition of being past feeling, what I initially felt. Next. The idea of giving over to sensuality means the absence of restraint. It's not anymore that I I, I don't... um, you know, I've lost feeling, but it's that it takes greater and greater degrees of the thing to give me any feeling at all. So for those of you who have struggled with pornography, you know it starts out very innocently and then it doesn't stop, it progresses. You know, drugs, I mean, we could categorize, you know, we could categorize all of the human vices, but they all fall under this sort of idea that at some point you lose the ability to feel what you initially felt with a healthy desire, And then it requires more and more and more and more to bring back the feeling. And so you ultimately end up something he calls greed. Now greed, we um, only associate with money. But the word literally means an insatiable need for more. It's the law of diminishing returns. And any of us who have, have wrestled through the normal common human vices understand Paul's identifying exactly how they work. It is possible to take a really healthy, great gift and desire and to see it corrupted and disordered, you know, to where we're like Smeagol from Lord of the Rings. I'm full of like sci-fi references this morning or something, right? Where he's got my precious, right? The desire for the one ring has corrupted him and bent him around it. That's the idea. So of course, there are warnings in the scriptures around sexuality because it it is so powerful and we all know this. But that's not where the story starts. The story starts with it's good. But we have to be careful. And so when Jesus talks about covenanting, he's not talking about normal sexual desire. He's talking about when our will gets involved and we start acting upon that. That's then what he's ruling out. And remember, these aren't new laws. These are illustrations of the righteousness of the kingdom. The people of Jesus' kingdom aren't content with just not murdering Right? We're people that work on our anger and contempt. And we're not people who think sexual purity just means don't commit adultery. No, we're people who actually work on the desires of our heart. Now, are you with me so far? Any questions on this? This is so important because it, for me, I can't speak to you, but for me, this was so wrongly presented. 
I hear whispering, yes. Oh, yes. Yes. Ladies and gentlemen, Susie Lind. <laughs> Jesus quotes from the Septuagint. And the, the word he uses in the Septuagint is the translation that was used from you shall not covet. You're welcome. <laughs> huh? Yeah. The language is Greek. We'll have a panel discussion here just in a second. No, thank you, Susie. That's a great question. Absolutely, if I wasn't clear about that. Yes. Anything else? Yes, John. Oh, purity culture is such a great topic. John's question is, why do you think the church is aligned with purity culture? Now that, that's a conversation. Just a couple of thoughts. <laughs> there is nothing wrong for the invitation um, to be holy as God is holy. But very often, we've come at holiness not from a biblical understanding. Biblical understanding of holiness is different. It's not moral purity. And even the word purity has been corrupted to only mean sexual purity. And so when you look at you know, pastors around our celebrity pastors, very rarely until recently were they ever fired for greed, for power games, for manipulation, for abuse, but it was almost exclusively sexual sin. We've elevated sexual sin to the point where almost nothing else is as important. And, and truly, that was the message I received. My heart didn't matter. What I did with my body did. So I was succumbing to the righteousness of the scribes and the Pharisees, right? And that is why Jesus stands opposed to forms of Christianity that just reintroduce what Jesus came himself to demolish. So purity culture is easy. It's easy to know who's in, who's out. It avoids all the weird, messy questions. It's very easy to judge others, and, and, and this is my personal opinion, not the view of Journey Church. Very often, we focus on the sexual sins we don't commit. You know, so the evangelical church committed to purity really didn't do much with divorce, but had a field day against the gay community. You know? But Jesus speaks very clearly about inappropriate divorce, and we'll look at that next week. Joy. But that's, the, that's where I would start. Pure, the idea of sexual purity is far different in the kingdom of Jesus than what we've been told by the American church. And in some ways, it's easier to manage and easier to control and easier to profit from. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, it's easy, for, it's easy for those of us who are married and have sex. Hey, guys, you just need to calm down. <laughs> yeah, and, and you throw on to that the fact that marriage is such a different thing than it was back then. You were getting married when you hit puberty. So I, I'm all for, just so we, we're clear, I think, I think the warnings about sexual morality are real and they matter. Absolutely. But they, they are placed in a greater context that none of us have taken time to fully appreciate. And as such, they've, they've just formed into a new legalism that has, on both sides of it, either you've succeeded in purity culture terms, but you've never dealt with your heart, now you're married and you can't flip a switch that says, oh, this is fine now, or you've been shamed to believe the whole thing's dirty, naughty, bad, so heck with it. If I have to choose between my desires and this demanding God, I'm going to go with my desires. And those aren't the choices that the kingdom presents to us. They're just bigger than that. What a great question, John. Thank you. First point? Y yes. What about the gay community? Oh, that's a wonderful question. How does this apply to the gay community? Well, first of all, I'd assume it applies to the gay community in the way that it applies to every other community. Right, that sexu sexuality is a gift to be received, that members of the gay community are image bearers worthy of dignity and respect, 
And then the Christian community, as you know, Jock, divides completely over, well, what's that mean? And even our staff would have different views upon that. So I don't want to, I don't want to, well, here, here's something I would say. Um, wow, boy, this, I, this is so good, and I want to go there, but it's, it's, um, it's going to hijack the topic, because I have one more big point I need to make. But Jock, the gay community um, is worthy of respect, love, affirmation. I believe you can be gay and follow Jesus. I believe it is possible uh, as a community of broken sinners to work out our sal- salvation progressively over time. So I think all of that is absolutely important. And I think the church, I think the church needs to repent, frankly, of the way it's treated many of the gay community, uh, many people in the gay community because Here they are wrestling with some of the most profound questions of human existence, some of whom are cut off from family and persecuted, and then the church has this sign that simply says, hey, you're not welcome here. We'll tolerate people addicted to porn. We'll tolerate inappropriately divorced. We'll tolerate premarital sex. But if you're attracted to someone of the same sex, you know, we put up a sign there. And I just think the church needs to repent of all of that. I think the hospitality of the table demands that all can come. So great question, and we can talk more, because again, that doesn't answer the question, well, do we think uh, being gay is a sin? I don't think the Bible condemns being gay. The question is, okay, are same-sex erotic activities permitted, and then we're into huge worlds of biblical scholarship. Thank you so much for asking that question. And you, my friend, I hear stories about you and the gift you've been to our community, so thank you. Anything else? While we're on every topic, let's talk about abortion. <laughs> yes, young lady. So what would you tell your kids? I grew up in purity culture. Yeah. Oh, what would I tell my kids about purity culture? Yeah, how would I talk about sexuality? What's the alternate? Oh, it's 9.50. Okay, we have one very big point to make still. This is, man, these are great. These are great. And this is Mike Erie talking. I am, I am so flawed, so fallible. I've messed up so many ways. Yes? I've got a class after we're taking after questions. Okay, Kevin has a class at 11. Yes, go ask him. No, <laughs> I, no, no, I love this. This is awesome. Guys, this is the community we want to be, right? These are the most important things. And so to talk about them with grace and kindness to each other is so very important. So yes, the conversation continues, but I'm going to take a crack at this. And you interrupted my just declaring my utter sinfulness and failure in every way possible. Yeah, I know you tried to save me. Thank you, Kevin. No, um, so, so I think, I don't, um, I think the way I parent is the way God seems to parent me. And God invites me into to live in an identity that I already have and cannot lose. And to slowly and progressively live that identity as it affects my behavior. So what I mean is like when you get married, um, you become, I became a husband before I knew what it meant to be a husband. Husbands, can I get an amen? All of a sudden I have an identity now and I'm invited to become the husband I already am in the security of the covenant of marriage. And that never stops. And what the scripture, what the, what the imperatives are in the New Testament, I've learned are, are invitations to wisdom. They're not rules that if you break, you lose something. You may through consequences, yes. But God's not up there as a taskmaster going, well, okay, here's my purity checklist. What we invite, have invited our kids to, into is wisdom. And we've talked at length. Here's, if, if you do, uh, here's, here's our stories first. Secondly, here's how we understand the teaching. We, from the very first moment, we were committed to announcing that it was good. And, and to see that modeled between mom and I, even though it grossed them out. <laughs> the second thing we did is when they started asking questions, we used real words and we just told the truth. And those are some of the funniest conversations we've ever had. My son Nate decided he would rather high five 
um, a girl rather than do anything else in order to get her pregnant. And it was just fantastic. <laughs> the third thing we did is we invited, we invited wisdom. We didn't make rules. So, and we, we've, we've said, listen, we can't control you. Right? You can hide, you can lie, there's nothing we can do to control your behavior. And that's not even our role as parents. Our role isn't to manage their sin. Our role is to form and shape their heart out of a certain kind of family community. And so we didn't put hard and fast rules down, we just talked to them about wisdom. And as we've talked about wisdom, we've talked about, listen, if you do have premarital sex to our, to our daughter, we've simply said, we will, if you were to get pregnant, we would absolutely adore you and help you Raise your child. I mean, it, like, there's our, our approval and acceptance and your belonging in our family has nothing to do with, with failure at all. It's irrelevant. Now, we invite wisdom and we would grieve over the choices they make. And those of you who are far longer, far longer on the parental jour- parental journey know exactly what that feels like. I'm just learning it. But that's kind of how we approached it, at least to start. The thing we valued more than anything else with our kids is that they feel safe to tell us anything. And they have. You'd just be shocked at the things they've... (laughs) And you gotta learn a poker face. You know, I'm just sitting here like this. (laughs) Oh, really? What was that like? How did that go? And that (laughs) thing that we wanna just crush him. All right, all right, I got one more point to make. First of all, you guys are awesome. Second of all, incredible questions. Third of all, I'm always trying to balance getting through the rest of the teaching with answering the questions, and so man, we could spend so much time on these, and I love it. But as Kevin said, we do have a place for that, and I love that too. All right, so the goodness of sexual desire, the warning about where coveting leads and what it does to us. But then there's one last, and this is the most, I think, profound thing that Jesus is doing. Jesus is talking to a huge crowd, correct? Who's that crowd made up of? Ordinary Ordinary people. Do you think there are women in that crowd? But who does Jesus address when he gets to this section? Only the men. Does Jesus think women don't have sexual desire and don't struggle with coveting? No, come on, Jesus is really smart. Of course not. So why does he only address the men? The answer is because of the double standard that existed at the time. The women in in some parts of Jewish culture and early parts of Christian culture and still today were blamed as the ones who led men into sin. There are examples of this from the early church that are just crazy. Um, Or even rabbinic literature. Not all. I mean, there were exceptions to all of this. But go ahead, Joe. Fire up some rabbis. So this is Rabbi Jose, that's not how you pronounce it, provides an extreme example of the tendency to blame the victim. He was said to have had a beautiful daughter, only one day he caught a man drilling a hole in a fence to catch a glimpse of her. When the rabbi challenged the intruder, uh, the intruder answered, Master, if I'm not worthy enough to marry her, may I not at least uh, be worthy to catch a glimpse of her? Rabbi then turned around to his daughter and said, you are a source of trouble to mankind. Return to the dust so that men may not sin because of you. Next. Tertullian, an early Christian writer, insisted that even natural beauty ought to be obliterated by concealment and neglect, since it is dangerous to those who look at it. So women, you should conceal and neglect yourselves. And then notice the name of this little tractate, on the apparel of women. You should never read this written from a guy. Next. (laughs) From Sirach. With a married woman, dine not. Recline at your table to drink by her side, lest your heart be drawn to her, and you go down in blood to the grave. Right, so there's the Billy Graham rule um, in early Jewish culture. Next. Talk not much with women kind, was the general admonition. Okay. Next, that's a whole lot of introductory words, but I'm just showing references. It is taught, no man should walk on a road behind a woman, even if she is is his own wife. 
If she happened to be in front of him on a bridge, he should leave her on one side. And whoever crosses a river behind a woman has no share in the uh, life to come. Because you would stare at her evidently. I didn't know if that part was obvious or not. So what does Jesus do when he addresses men? Has there been one gender typically that is, has used sexuality as a tool of violence and a tool of oppression, a tool of blaming and shaming? Yeah, of course, we all know this, it's men. And notice, Jesus doesn't warn his disciples against women, he warns men against themselves and thereby removes the double standard. It is not a woman's issue if you covet it is yours. Yeah. So we even see that in expressions of today's purity culture, right? Women, it's your job. Never mind that modesty in Paul's writings always has to do with not dressing expensively. So Jesus does something very profound, and how I want to close our time together is as, as guys... I want, um, I want us to pray over our sisters because the most important thing for Jesus in the kingdom of God is that women are safe. They are saved from the coveting glances. They are safe from abuse and manipulation. They are safe from exploitation and objectification. And that has nothing to do with them and everything to do with us. Now, of course, women have lust issues and pornography issues and all sorts of things, but that's not who Jesus is talking to here. So my invitation as a way to symbolically proclaim and inhabit this is I want to invite all the guys to stand up. I'm not going to have you do anything embarrassing, but standing up is a start, okay? So just go ahead and do that. And I want to invite you to go to the outside of the room to uh, surround the women in the center. So just go to the outsides of the room. I know this is moving around in church. I know it's totally a violation of all church rules. Yeah, there we go. Now, ladies, I would love for you to just simply close your eyes and to receive this. For some of us, this is an act of repentance. For some of us, this is an act of hope and faith. For some of us, for some of us, it's just the reminder of how often you have been mistreated and, and misunderstood and misused. So gentlemen, what I'm gonna ask is we're gonna take 30 seconds and we're gonna pray. Now, not all of you are comfortable praying and that is just fine, so we're gonna do it silently. Right, So you can look, just close your eyes and people will think you're praying and you don't even have to pray. But for some of us who are into that whole praying thing, I want to invite us to pray over our sisters. We're going to do 30 seconds of quiet and then I'll close. But I want to pray that they would see their value and worth in God's eyes and not in culture's eyes. And that's easy, easy for us to pray. And hard, much harder for them to live that women would be safe in our community. And that shame and wounds and hurts and disappointment in this realm of life, God might begin to heal. And then just pray for us, for the ways that we contribute to the double standard even today, for the ways we might be invited to walk into repentance. So we're just gonna take a moment in quiet. Gentlemen, if you would pray, and ladies, would you just receive this?
excuse me. <coughs> Sorry about that. In the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Father, we ask that you would minister and bless our sisters. <coughs> and I rebuke the coughing demon. Father, I can't imagine, I literally cannot imagine some of the hurts and the pain and the wounds. And God is one who has contributed to the mess. I just stand before you in repentance, confession. And I pray that you would form me into a person and form us into a community. <coughs> oh, bless your heart. In the good sense, not bless your heart in the bad sense. That you would form us into community where it is safe to be a woman. God, we recognize that guilt doesn't bring healing, that shame doesn't bring healing. Grace and truth bring healing. And so, Father, may this be a community. <coughs> of men and women who journey into this together. Father, draw near to your daughters. Bring healing and shalom. Bless them richly. In the name of Jesus, our Christ, amen. Guys, if you would, come back. <coughs> As always, our communion tables are open. Pieces of paper that you can write on, those are available. Such an honor to be a part of this community and to talk about such things. So Lord Jesus, we stand now in agreement that you are worthy and that we want to embrace the life that is really life. So draw near to us as we draw near to you now. Amen. Thank you.